Oops, sorry. Hang on. Okay. I've come to believe that my sense of humor is more historical than hysterical. Now, any of you remember when a rite of passage for a little boy was to do a James Cagney imitation? Are you the dirty rat that shot my ma and pa and they made fun of me? I was born and raised in Brooklyn. In 1981, I achieved my dream. I moved into the city. And I lived in four separate apartments in the West 57th Street area. Each one was worse than the other. <laughs> and my last apartment was so small that if we got to Sunday Times, either I or my wife had to sleep outside. <laughs> but it had two things going for it. One, I could walk to work, because I worked in an office in Times Square, and two, I kept bumping into celebrities. I remember one day walking back to work from having lunch in my apartment on Broadway, and a young man cut in front of me, and I looked up, and it was like a snapshot with a caption. I want those looks. It was John Kennedy Jr. and he was stunning. <laughs> One day I walked out of Paul Stewart's men's store and I think I paid like $80 for a bathrobe just because they had their logo on it. And there was an entourage going up the street on Madison Avenue and in front of it was Sammy Davis Jr. And again, that caption, my God, he'd be too tiny to be a jockey. <laughs> <laughs> On a coffee break, I was outside the half price ticket booth. And there by a payphone, you remember those, was a striking tall man with prominent cheekbones and straight silver gray hair. It was Jack Palance. And I actually have a family connection to him because my mother was very pregnant when she was watching Shane, a classical <laughs> movie at the Linda Movie House on Nostrand Avenue and Parkside Avenue. It would star Alan Ladd as the good guy and Jack Palance always played the villain. What they had was they had this big man on this small pony with his legs almost touching the ground. It really made him sinister. I'm sure the Peter people today would have something to say about that. But anyway, she never got to see the end of the movie because she had to rush to Kings County Hospital. It was just a few blocks away. And over the years, she would say, I wanted to name Michael, Michael Shane. But I didn't think Michael Shane Zaharakos went well. <laughs> Today, it would be perfectly normal. One Friday night, I was at the old Regency Movie House, which is gone, on West 66th Street. And they had an Alec Guinness retrospective. I was all the way in the balcony in the back. And about four rows ahead of me was a handsome couple. And I recognized them right away. And they were having a delightful conversation. Well, this is New York, as expected. A voice from the dark growled, why don't you shut the F up? Well, Richard Harris, the movie star, got up. And I could see that bubble over his head. Doesn't he know who I am? <coughs> well, I am out of line. So I guess I'll have to shut the F up and just watch the movie like everybody else. They were playing kind hearts and coronets. The most memorable celebrity sighting I ever had was one Saturday morning, I was at Broadway and 8th Street. And there was a, a little old man with a very round back, clutching two shopping bags. It looked like he was had his provisions for the weekend from Balducci's or Jefferson Market. And I did a double take, double take, but I was sure it was Joseph Wiseman, 
a great New York actor who is known for playing Dr. No in the first James Bond movie <laughs> with Sean Connery. Well, I've moved to the suburbs, away from my beloved city. The umbilical cord can be cut, but it's never severed. I enjoy once a month coming down to the East Village where I can rub shoulders with those great actors and actresses from that world prestigious rhymes of the ancient mariners <laughs> and some. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.